Thank you, Jan. Welcome to the Hill Baptist Church, where our mission is to love God, love people, make disciples of Jesus Christ, and we're glad to have you all with us in person and those who are joining us online. I do have something I'd love for you to do if you are a first-time guest with us, or maybe you just haven't received uh, the information we send out each week, but I'd love for you to sign up for our email list. Uh, you can sign up to receive our emails by going to our Facebook page, The Hill Baptist Church, and sign up there, or you can go to our website, thehillbaptist.com. Sign up there, and you'll get all the information you need each week as far as the different activities that are going on, ministries, and how you can get involved. So hope you'll do that. Also, we're in the process of uh, planning our next baptism service, and so if you've placed your faith in Christ but you've never been baptized, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'd love to uh, celebrate that with you that day and have you uh, follow the Lord, in, the Lord in baptism as well. <clears throat> so talk to me about that if that is something you'd like to do. Uh, also, too, we are uh, worshiping the Lord in our giving continually, even though we don't do it like we normally used to do it. Uh, but you can give your offering today by putting it in the offering plates at the front or the back of the church sanctuary as you leave. Or you can give online at thehillbaptist.com backslash give or just click on give and it'll walk you through. It's real simple. Also, too, a few other opportunities for giving uh, over the next several weeks are these. One is Mission Georgia. We have a goal of $1,000 that we're trying to raise for missions in the state of Georgia. Uh, we're well on our way. I think we're only a few hundred dollars away from our goal, so we're moving right along. Uh, but all the money that you give to that goes to support missions within the state of Georgia. Also, too, we're raising money for our safety project. Uh, we're going to be installing some cameras and some up, you know, changing up some doors and just making our, our building as safe as it can be. And so if you'd like to give to that, you can get more information about that in the bulletin as well. But, um, but just try to take advantage of those opportunities to worship the Lord in your giving. <clears throat> and we're just glad you're here today to worship with us and also to celebrate uh, Jan's years of service to our church and the Lord. And we're excited about uh, this service as we've come together to do that. So let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Father, we are so grateful for how you've blessed us. Uh, individually, as a church family, in so many ways. And Lord, we're especially mindful today of, uh, of Jan's contribution uh, to uh, the worship that occurs in this place. Uh, thank you for her, and thank you for uh, everybody here that's gathered and that is gathering with us online. Thank you for how you've gifted them and uh, how you offer to have us participate in what you're doing in the world. Lord, we invite you today to uh, move us down that path, to bring about the change you want to see in our lives, to equip us, to motivate us, to compel us to serve you uh, all the days of our lives. And we pray even today would be a motivator uh, for that to happen. And we just pray you'd be with this service in a special way, that you'd be honored and glorified, and uh, that you would bring about what you want to bring about, Lord. We just trust you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So let's do that this morning as we turn in our worship guide to the songs that are listed there. Rejoice the Lord is King. We'll have a slight pause between the two and we'll go right into the one right across there from it is uh, Rejoice, and we will sing together joyfully. Let us stand together. the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, and I say rejoice. Jesus the Savior. our stains, he took our seat above, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice, his kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven, the keys of death. Hell are to our church. 
rejoice again, I say rejoice, rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord and Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, for it comes, rejoice, give thanks and sing. sing bright youth and snow crowned age both men and women raise on high or free salting song declare God's wondrous praise rejoice 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 give thanks and sing yes all through life's singing as we go from you to age by night and day in gladness and in woe rejoice 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 give thanks and sing still lift your standard up sing as you Psalm 103 tells us, it says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins. Then down in verse 10, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. You know, God's love has been perfectly demonstrated for us through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. And forgiveness is made possible for us and for our sins because of the work of Christ through his death and resurrection. And adoption into God's family has been granted to us because of what Christ has done. And yet, at times we do forget those benefits. And so I want us just to take a moment and just individually and silently confess our sins to God and thank Him for all the benefits that are ours in Christ. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, for the times we have followed the path of the wicked, stood in solidarity with those who were wrong or sat quietly and allowed sin to happen, forgive us. Help us to meditate, even delight in your word, so that we will flourish with the fruit of your spirit. Amen. Our next two hymns uh, declare God's greatness for us as sinners. Let's turn to hymn number 156 and stand as we sing, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. We'll follow that by singing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let us stand. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, Jesus, lover of my 
Jesus, what a help in sorrow, while the billows on me roll. Even when my heart is breaking, He, my comfort, helps my soul. Hallelujah, what a Savior. scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood seal my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a savior guilty vile and helpless weak spotless lamb of God was he full of can it be? Hallelujah! What a Savior! Lifted up was He to die. It is finished, was His cry. Now in heaven exalted I. Hallelujah! What a Savior! Our glorious King, all His ransomed home to bring. Then anew this song we'll sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Please be seated.
Thank you, Jan. You know, whether you're joining us for the first time this morning, or maybe just recently, or maybe you've been a part of our church for decades, you have experienced why Jan Sutton has been such a gift to our church. You know, she started playing the piano, I think she said when she was 11 years old at the church, and she's been playing ever since. So she has played for our church uh, the better part of 40 plus years, as well as some other churches when they were out of town for a little while. But for, for the past 50 years, she's been using her gifts to help us worship God, and it's been such a blessing to have her here. I, don't, I haven't done the math, but I would imagine uh, tens of thousands of songs uh, you've played on that piano in rehearsal and musicals and worship services. But, you know, and even in our church over the past decades, I mean, pastors come and go, uh, choir members come and go, um, choir directors and ministers of music come and go. Uh, but Jan has remained a constant in our music ministry for these many decades. And because of her faithfulness to God and our church family, we just want to publicly give her thanks and thank the Lord for her and, and what she's done in our church family and for us. And, and to help us do that, I've asked three of our music ministers, past and present, uh, just to share a few words about working with Jan. So first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the mic to Fred and Ann Gunner, and they're going to share a little bit. And then I've asked uh, Bob Walker, who was our music minister a few years ago, uh, he recorded a little video for Jan. I'm going to play that for you if everything works, so you can be praying simultaneously while Fred shares it. That'll work. And then Floyd is going to share a few words, and then I'll, I'll come and conclude. So, Fred, why don't you share with us? take long for us to realize that time marches on. Jan and I have said that for many years uh, we have been around here ourselves. Uh, late September of 2009 we had been here for 40 years and the Hill Baptist Church has meant so much to us during those years. As we look back over these years it is amazing of all that has transpired during this time. What comes to mind today that now comes to an end, the presence, the dedication, the faithfulness, the talent, the love, and many other things that would describe Jan Gibson Sutton and the life that she lives and has given to this congregation for 40 years plus. Jan, you have given the Hill Baptist Church your time, your talents, your love. You have given yourself and much more to this church. We as members of the church realize, and yet we are, know that we all must be faithful to the ways that you've lived, the way that you've given yourself, the way that you've allowed us to love you and care for you, and to have been blessed by the talents that you have. <coughs> to say the least, you will be missed. It will be difficult to replace Jan Sutton. I will conclude by saying that your love and prayers for us and our love and prayers for you and your family will go on and on for years and days to come. You must believe that our love and appreciation for you will never cease, but it will go on forever and forever. May God bless you, Jan. I well remember that first day that we visited the Hill Baptist Church. This vibrant young lady, I thought she was a teenager at the time, introduced herself and said how glad she was we were here and she hoped we liked y'all enough that we would come back. Well, we did, and we did, and we're still here 41 years later. What a blessing it has been, and Jan has been a major part of our joy. The beauty and inspiration of her music are beyond description, but we have been blessed by her friendship as well. I think of her and Al's wedding, a beautiful bride she was, 
Incidentally, their anniversary is one day and one year later than ours. <laughs> the birth of the children gave us a chance to love and babysit at times. The visits in your home and in our home have been so blessing, so blessed, and, and such memories were created from these things, even our washing dishes. We just know and pray that there will be many or more opportunities to share in friendship and music as you come to our house and play the piano, as we may have the opportunity to hear you at your house playing the piano. But just the friendship that we share with your family has been such a blessing to us. And remember that you and RJ are supposed to say, play, morning has broken at my funeral, as well as great as our faithfulness. But I don't have the date for that anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing. Yeah, I asked Bob Walker, he served here as a music minister for several years and now lives in Florida, so he couldn't obviously be here, especially with the pandemic, but I did want to have him share a few words, so let's see if we can bring Bob here virtually. Congratulations. What a ministry you've had at the Hill Baptist Church. Um, I, you're going to be missed uh, by everyone. We miss you guys all the time. Uh, it's really a, the end of an era, musically, starting a, uh, something new now. But uh, you are uh, always our favorite pianist. You could put anything in front of you and you could play it. You didn't always think you could, but you could. You always did a great job. You're a great person to serve with, minister with, and I wish you... Uh, all the best in the future, and good luck. I'm assuming Al's still around. You're going to need a lot of luck. But no, seriously, we uh, we love you guys. We miss everyone there at the church, and we love serving with you. And uh, I know that God's not through with you, and you'll be serving him with your music uh, as you continue on. But uh, just wanted to say a word of appreciation just from us, just, just how much you meant to us while we were there. And enjoy the days ahead. God bless. Well, I don't have the longevity of relationship with Jan, but then, whoa, let's, let's stop. Our lives have been intertwined since about 1976. Uh, I think we did Handel's Messiah here that Christmas. Do you remember that? I was never, never one afraid of challenges, and neither was Jan. Uh, Jan, y you've been one of the, my shining stars of folks that I wanted to work with uh, throughout my career. Uh, and I've been around a long time, too. So I've, we were children when we started, so I've, I've been about 50 years as well. But long story short is Jan is uh, always prepared, always ready, always has a smile. Sometimes she might frown if you throw something at her she's not expecting, but that, we do that all the time, don't we? But God has blessed her with a great talent, and she's used it faithfully. And, you know, we all should aspire to be just like Jan in terms of using our talent, whatever it might be, whether it's playing the piano or so forth. These hymns that she played this morning touch my heart because Scripture is important. I would encourage you to go to BibleQuest.com and look up the text to these Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's the scripture. Each of these are. What a great testimony to her faith and our faith as well. Jan, we love you, and God loves you more, and he's got great things in store for you. Thank you. Well, Jan, as, a, as they've already said, you know, you've been a faithful member of the church for a long time. And, uh, and Al as well, and you're just, your whole family. I've uh, been our pianist for several decades, and you're truly a treasure. Uh, Martin Luther once said that next to the Word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. And your, your talent has helped us as a church enjoy that treasure. And the, the music coming from your piano has helped worship uh, flow from our hearts. 
And so we've been blessed by your service. And now as followers of Jesus, we know that your treasure truly is, is in heaven. Uh, however, we do want to express our thankfulness and our gratitude in a few ways. One um, is that we've created a, a music ministry fund uh, called the Connie Blanchard and Jan Sutton Music Ministry Fund. And this fund will give people the opportunity to continually invest in our music ministry for years to come. And the second way we want to express our gratitude is by presenting you with, with a love offering, which is just obviously a small token of our appreciation. So I'm going to ask you and Al just to come forward and um, just want to give this to you. And I want to pray for you as you transition and move into this next season of your life. And I know God has great plans in store for you, uh, whether you play a piano or play with the grandchildren or <laughs> whatever it may be. But I know that you're going to serve the Lord faithfully. So thank you, and let me pray for them as they consider the transition God has in store for them. God, we thank you for Jan, we thank you for Al, we thank you for their family, uh, we thank you for the blessings that they have bestowed upon us in the service to you. Uh, Lord, we're, we're so grateful for all of these years, and we just pray as they move into this next season of life, the next challenge you have for them, the next roles that you give them. Would you strengthen them, God? Would you help them to have the endurance to finish strong, to finish well, to finish the race, uh, the course that you have set in front of them? God, we give you thanks and praise for them, uh, and we know that you will be with them in a special way as they move forward, and we give you glory for all you've accomplished through this family, and you will co continue to accomplish, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you. Like Fred said, time marches on, continues on, but God continues to work in our midst, and he has plans for all of us, and we're so thankful. And I think uh, as we look at the scripture this morning, it's going to be a fitting passage to look at as we consider uh, this end of an era here at our church and even thinking about what God has next for Al and Jan, but also what God has for us as well. So I want to read a few verses of Scripture as we begin. It comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm just going to read verses 6 through 8 this morning. Paul writes these words, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. May God bless the reading of his word. You know, in more ways than one, we're experiencing the end of a chapter this morning. Uh, obviously, we're selling, celebrating the many decades of service that Jan has contributed to our church family, and we're also ending the letter to 2 Timothy, or to Timothy, called 2 Timothy. And one of the truths that we see in the passage here is that there is no such thing as retirement in the Lord's service. Uh, you may switch roles, switch places, but God always has something in store for us to do. And so we're looking forward to what God has in store for Al and Jan and their family. You know, as followers of Jesus, we have a race to run. We have a course to finish. We have a fight to fight. And until the day that we breathe our last breath, we have the opportunity to represent Jesus uh, to those around us. And in the time just remaining, remaining this morning, I want to share with you some reflections from a faithful Christian. You know, these are the last words, 2 Timothy, these are the last words from the Apostle Paul that we have. And he's writing Timothy, a younger man, uh, to encourage him and challenge him to fulfill his ministry the ministry that God had given him. And so as we come to the end of this letter, we almost have this Moses passing the baton of leadership to Joshua moment, this David passing the baton to Solomon moment, the Elijah to Elisha moment. You see a transition from someone who is nearing the end to someone who is still very young in their journey. And Paul is writing about that transition. You know, he's sharing that 
his ministry is coming to an end. And as he does so, he is challenging Timothy and those who come behind him to fulfill the ministry that God has given them. And the way he does that is by reflecting on his life in these few verses. And what Paul does is he gives us five analogies that describe his, his life with Christ. The first analogy is that his life is like uh, pouring out a drink offering. In verse 6 he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And under the old covenant, the drink off offering would often accompany other offerings. But there was something very unique about the drink offering. In that when the drink offering was offered up, it was completely poured out. So if you were to bring the drink offering, you would completely pour it out before the Lord. None of it would go to the priest. It was an offering completely for God. Now I want you to think about this. Imagine a, a, a pitcher of water. And this, this pitcher represents your life. And the water inside this pitcher represents the years of your life. And now I want you to think about you know, this pitcher. And it has various amounts of water depending on our, our lives. You know, some of us live different amounts of time. But we all have this water, amount of water, this amount of time in our pitcher of life. And you know, when you, when you pour out a pitcher of water, it really doesn't take much intentionality to simply just pour it out. I mean, kids do it all the time, right? <laughs> all over the place. But it does take intentionality to pour out the pitcher of water in a specific direction, into a glass, for example. And so when we look at this passage, when Paul says, you know, my life is being poured out as a drink offering, He's saying, I have been pouring out my life for a specific purpose. I've been intentionally living out my life. And so the question is, you know, for what purpose are you pouring out your life? You know, what, is, what is causing the years of your life to go in a certain direction? You know, we look at the Apostle Paul and, it, and we, it's evident that Paul poured out his life for Christ. Why? Because Christ poured out his life for Paul. And you see it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Listen to what Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the whole way that Paul approached life was altered when he became a Christian, when he became a follower of Jesus. You know, he poured out his life so people would know Jesus and follow him. And so I want you to think about that. You know, how are you pouring out your life? What's giving direction to the years of your life? You know, as Paul reflects on his life, it's clear that the one who guided his, his steps was Jesus, and his life was poured out for the glory of God. The second analogy that Paul uses is that of a ship. Uh, Paul says in verse 6, the time of my departure has come. And so I want you to picture a ship tied up to a dock. And now I want you to picture the captain of that ship telling the crew, all right, it's time to loosen the ropes. It's time to hoist the anchor. It's time to set sail. And then you see this, this ship begin to sail away to its destination. You know, in the first analogy, Paul talks about the end of his life. You know, my, my life is coming to an end. I'm being poured out as a drink offering. But now Paul is talking about what happens after his end will come. He's talking about where he will be going. He talks about the journey that he'll be on into the next life. And here's the reality. For all of us, our ship will depart at some point. And there will come a day when the ropes are loosened and the anchor is hoisted and the ship will move toward its destination. And the question is, when that day comes, where will, where will your ship be headed? You know, Paul knew his destination. Early in his ministry, he told the church in Philippi, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
If I am to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. See, if you've placed your faith in Christ, then you can have that same type of assurance. So when the time of your departure comes, you will know where you're headed. You're headed to be with Christ. The third analogy is that of a fighter going the distance. In verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. You know, as Paul reflects on his life, no doubt he considers all the challenges he's faced. I mean, the, uh, the temptations, the physical abuse, uh, the disappointments, the betrayals, the pain. But Paul fought through all those challenges, trusting in God. And I think we all agree that life is a battle. It's a challenge. And if we're going to live for Christ, it takes intentionality. And if we're going to live for Christ, we need to dress accordingly. We we need to put on the armor of God if we're going to engage in this battle. And Paul described more in detail the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. But simply put, we need faith in Christ. We need the knowledge of God's word. We need the the power of God's spirit working through us. We need to, to participate in a life of prayer because we need the transformation power of Christ if we're going to fight the good fight. The fourth analogy is that of a runner finishing his race. Paul Paul writes, I have finished the race. Now notice he didn't say, I have won the race. He just says, I have finished the race. And that should encourage all of us, right? We're not running against one another to see who can get there first, necessarily. We're not competing with each other. But we're running the race that God has set out for us to run. And it's this race that God wants us all to finish. He wants you to finish your race. The fifth analogy is that of guarding a treasure. Paul writes, I have kept the faith. You know, he's not only believed the gospel, but he has guarded the integrity of the gospel. Uh, You know, he has made it his life's work to share the gospel that was given to him by Christ and affirmed by the apostles. And he saw it as a treasure. You know, Jesus once said this parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You know, for Paul, the gospel was his prized possession that he willingly and freely shared with all those around him. And throughout his many years of ministry, he kept the faith. Now, after listening to these these five analogies, let's consider this question. Why should we pour out our lives as a drink offering? I mean, why should we, uh, you know, fight the good fight? Why should we try to finish the race? You know, why should we keep the faith? Well, Paul tells us in verse 8 why we should do this. He writes, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, the reason why we should pour out our lives for the glory of God, the reason we should go the distance, finish the race, keep the faith, is that there's more to life than this life. There's more to life than this life. The crown of righteousness will be rewarded to us in the life to come. Another way to say it is this, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The eternal life that God offers for those in Christ is what Paul treasured. I mean, it's what motivated him. Even when people walked away from him, he stayed motivated because that was his treasure. It kept him going. Even when people rejected Christ, he kept going because that was his treasure. It compelled him to go to new places, reach new people. You know, the crown of righteousness can only be awarded by Jesus. He's the only one that can award that. He's the only one that can give eternal life. And this is what fueled Paul's life. And Paul then tells Timothy, you know, he had just mentioned in verse 5, fulfill your ministry, Timothy. And then he tells Timothy, this should be his direction too. Seek after this crown. Pursue the crown of righteousness, this this relationship with Jesus for eternity. Notice that Paul says there is 
laid up for him a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to him on that day. But did you catch what he said at the end? He said, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, this is one of the few instances where you can find support for giving everyone a participation trophy. You know, participation trophies. Now people, if they're on a sports team, like everybody gets a trophy. Well, this is one of the passages you can actually find some support for that. It's not about your first place trophy or you, the fastest runner trophy. Paul says, you know what? If you love Jesus, there is a waiting for you this crown of righteousness. He's gonna, he awarded it to Paul, and he will award it to you as well. He's saying that if you love Jesus and follow him to the end of your life, then you will receive the same crown that Paul received. Receiving the crown of righteousness from Jesus is not the result of preaching many sermons in a church or even playing a piano for decades or teaching a Sunday school class or running a business that blesses the community or being a good husband, wife, or parent. The person who will receive the crown of righteousness is the person who loves Jesus. It's the person who wants to be with Christ. Who will go to heaven? Who will be with Christ for eternity? The one who wants to be. The one who loves Christ, who has given their life to Christ, placed their faith in Christ. The one who loves Jesus will pour out his life or her life for the glory of God and the good of others. And so if you're that person then you'll be able to say with Paul, I've been crucified with Christ. You know, what I treasured, what I valued before has been uh, placed in a secondary position because my ultimate value is to be with Christ. And that motivates me. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And I wonder, can you say that this morning? That I'm living for Christ. I want to pursue Christ. You know, have you given your life to Christ? Again, the one who will receive the crown of righteousness is not the one who earns it, but the one who loves his appearing. The one who loves Christ, wants to be with Christ, who has faith in Christ. You know, I wonder, is your life direction uh, set above just graduation or getting the job or getting married or having children or retiring or buying the house or traveling or having grandchildren? I mean, all those are wonderful things, but is that your goal? I mean, is that what your life is directed toward or is what... Is that which is directing your life something greater? Is it Christ? Is it being with Christ? Is it seeking Christ, following Christ, loving Christ? Is your life direction set on the appearing of Jesus? If so, then that direction will influence how you pour out your life. Just like Paul said, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. I am offering my life for the purposes of God. Because he loved Christ. He loved Jesus. And if you love Christ. You will follow Christ. You will allow God to pour your life out. In a way that glorifies him. And blesses those around you. You know Paul walked, for, Paul walked with Jesus for many decades. Before the time of his departure came. But you know, the way that you can ensure that you'll be walking with Jesus for decades is to walk with Jesus today. It's to pursue Christ today. And if you've never placed your faith in Christ, then I encourage you to begin that relationship even today. There's a, there's a next step card there in your pew in front of you. And it will lead you in a prayer that you can say to God, just expressing your desire. God, I want to start this relationship with you. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to turn away from sin, turn to Jesus, and pursue Him all the days of my life. I want to encourage you to make that decision. And for those of you who are in Christ, 
I want to challenge you to set the direction of your life to the appearing of Christ. All those other things are fine as well, but they need to be secondary to the appearing of Christ. That needs to be our perspective, our goal, our aim. So we will pour out our lives for the glory of God and the good of people. If the direction of our lives are set to the appearing of Christ, we will fight the good fight. We will finish the race. We will keep the faith. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this word from Paul as he was nearing the end of his life and reflecting on his life with Jesus. Uh, thank you for these pictures that motivate us to consider what, we, what are we living for? What are we pouring out our lives for? What are we aiming at? Lord, help us to have an eternal perspective. Help us to put Christ first and seek to know him and make him known. So that as we come to the end of our journey and the time of our departure comes, we can say like Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which Jesus will bestow on me because I have loved his appearing. May that be true of all of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, I encourage you, if you've never given your life to Christ, I encourage you to make that decision this morning. And for those of us in Christ, let us consider how we can pursue him today. And now let us stand and sing our final hymn together. As you leave today, don't forget to pick up a Mission Georgia prayer guide that walks us along a journey of prayer as we consider also giving to this missions offering. But hope you'll take one of these. They're in the vestibule in the back. Uh, and this Wednesday night through our Zoom gathering, uh, we will have an extended prayer time for some of these requests. Also, next Sunday, we're going to start a sermon series 
uh, dealing with uh, politics and Christianity as we approach this election season on, in November. And so I want to help us to walk through that, thinking biblically, prayerfully, praying for our country. And so I hope you'll be here next week for that. And again, just thank you, Jan, for all your years of service and being a blessing to us. And just remember, we're God's people. God has a race for us to, to run, to finish. And so let us do so in the power of God's Spirit as we seek to represent Christ to our city. Amen.